Welcome to Our Montana. I'm Mike Penfold. It's really cold out there now. Old Montana has shown us what a Montana winter looks like after having so much nice weather. Uh, it's cold and you can't help but wonder when we get this kind of weather what happens if the power goes out. How secure are we? Our Montana is helping the Yellowstone Valley Citizen Council with a program that they put together to help citizens look at the potential of having solar power on their personal home. Uh, they put together a webinar which uh, I taped and I'm going to show you some of this webinar because it's kind of good to give you some ideas whether you want to explore putting solar on your home. Hi everybody, my name is Andrew Bellinas. Present tonight, I'm going to talk about the process of going solar, how it works and some um, important just kind of facts and um, best practices to keep in mind as you're working through this process. So really quickly diving in just to make sure we're all on the same page. Uh, I want to go over some energy basics. Uh, when we talk about renewable energy and rooftop solar uh, and energy in general, we normally talk about two different things. We're talking about power and we're talking about energy. Power is kind of an instantaneous measurement. It's, it's a measurement of potential as well. So the term that we use most often to describe how much power we have is a kilowatt. A uh, kilowatt is a thousand watts. Um, and again, it's kind of an instantaneous measurement or, or potential. So you can talk about uh, a solar panel in size of watts or, or in our solar array in terms of kilowatts. Um, once you start using or producing power, uh, then you have energy, which is the amount of power used over a certain amount of time. And the um, units that we use for energy is kilowatt hours. So you take power, you multiply it by times, and you get the energy. Um, for frame of reference, the average or kind of typical rooftop solar system that we'll see in Montana is anywhere between five kilowatts and seven kilowatts. Um, we'll talk about panel sizes later. Um, but for reference, you know, coal strip unit four, which is a huge utility scale power plant. Um, unit four alone is 740 megawatts. So those are the kind of scales that we're talking about. Very, very different. Um, you know, rooftop solar is small, distributed, um, distributed scale, you know, on-site used right at the home or business. And the interesting, uh, interesting thing about the energy equation is that you can use it to calculate energy used as well as energy produced. So um, I threw some basic examples in here. Uh, you know, watching a football game, if you're running a TV for four hours, you can calculate how much power you're using. And for a solar panel, if you have a 300 watt panel and you're producing for six hours, you can calculate how much you're producing. Now there is a kind of efficiency factor in there, which you can ignore for now, um, but for you know, mo all intents and purposes, um, it's a pretty straightforward equation. So now that we have our terminology straight, um, is Montana a good place to go solar? And the answer is yes. You'll hear some people say no, uh, I disagree with them strongly. Um, Montana is a great place to go solar. And what you're seeing in front of you is a map of state of Montana put out by our DEQ that shows essentially the solar resource across the state. You'll notice there isn't much variation. Um, you know, it's kind of that, that same kind of medium range orange color. There are some lighter yellows up in the flathead, uh, some darker oranges down in the in this, um, southeastern part of the state. And this other graph, which shows uh, the, this um, bar graph here in the bottom left is actually from that same report from DEQ. And what it shows is that the energy use across the state uh, in different cities in those blue bars actually not only compares well to other cities within Montana, but to other markets around the US with a lot of solar installed. So places like Charlotte, North Carolina, um, Austin, Texas, Minneapolis, Minnesota, New York, these are all places with really big solar markets and our solar resource is just as good, if not better, than those markets. Now, we're never gonna be somewhere like Arizona or Napa or, or Honolulu or somewhere like that. Um, but, you know, we do have a good solar resource here. And a lot of that comes from our long summer days, which makes up for our shorter uh, winter nights. So, <clears throat> how to go shopping for renewable energy. Um, I, I, a lot of the information I put up on here is gonna come to you later through a one pager. Um, that we're going to share with you. And, you know, one of the things I want to mention is that one of the biggest benefits of participating in a Solarize program is that a lot of this information is kind of simplified for you. 
That's that's one of the greatest things about these types of programs. So I'm going to go through everything, um, but know that some of these steps will be made even easier for you by participating through the Solarize program. So your first step is gathering information. And here, um, you know, Tyler actually alluded to a bit of this in, in his introduction. Uh, you want to start thinking about your budget and your energy goals. Um, you want to start thinking about if you have a location in mind, either on your roof or on your ground, you know, do you want to do roof mounted or ground mounted? Um, do you want to be on grid or off grid? I'm assuming if you're billings, it's probably on grid. Um, but the budget and the energy goals are kind of the two that I would recommend you start thinking about before you even talk to an installer, because they're definitely going to ask. And it can be a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem. Some people like to have their energy goal and then, you know, work with whatever budget they, they can to make that happen. Um, some people have a specific budget and have to work with that to determine how much of their energy they can offset. Both are totally fine. It's just different approach to kind of this, to the same problem. Um, a great thing to start collecting now is some of your past energy bills. Um, ideally, an installer would love to see 12 months worth so that they can understand kind of your, your annual energy use. Um, so start collecting those and getting those ready. Um, if you want to be a nerd, much like I am, you can start putting them into a spreadsheet uh, for the installer. I'm sure they'll appreciate that as well. Um, so your information gathering is some of your basic um, kind of step one. Eventually, you're going to contact a local installer or through the program, you're going to be put in touch with a local installer. And they're going to ask you some of those questions that are up on the gathering information uh, section, which is why it's good to think about those first. Uh, they're also going to come out and do a site assessment. And like Tyler said, what they're going to do is look at the house. They're going to look at orientation. They're going to look at potential um, shading from trees. They're going to look at uh, different elements of the roof if it's you know, not just a standard pitched roof. Um, you know, they're going to measure the angle, they're going to really get all the information they need to put together um, a, a bid and a potential layout for your design to make sure that you're getting the most energy production that you can. Um, the next step is going to be reviewing costs and financing. So you've kind of already thought about your budget a little bit. Um, you want to think about now, okay, you know, your installer can either give you multiple options or they can just work within your budget and tell you what, what they think you can afford. Um, typically, solarized programs come with some kind of pricing structure. Um, you know, it's not always necessarily the, the rock bottom lowest, but one of the nice things is it's generally a, a good rate or a, or a competitive rate for the installation. And again, that takes a lot of the headache out of the equation. Um, so you'll have to look at that, make sure it meets your budget, and of course, tax credits and financing options, which I'll talk about later. Once you're ready to pull the trigger, you're, you're all set with your financing, you know you can afford it, you know what size system you want, all you have to do is sign the contract. And from there, your installer will um, schedule the installation and start moving forward with the process. Um, installation timelines typically depend on weather, on the installer schedule, um, there are inspections involved. There's also a good amount of uh, pre-approval paperwork that's required for the, uh, what's called the interconnection process and interconnection just means you know you are connecting to the utilities grid and so they need some paperwork and documentation before you can do that um, but your uh, solar installer is familiar with these processes the solar installers in montana do incredible work they do really really good work they're very knowledgeable and they know all about these processes and how to work through them so they will definitely guide you um, and and feel free to ask them questions um, they should definitely be a go-to resource for you, as will, of course, the Solarize program uh, kind of coordinators. And of course, the last and most fun step is um, once the installation is complete, you get to produce your own homegrown energy. Um, so let's uh, talk a little bit about solar panels themselves. For those who are a little less familiar, uh, panels come in pretty standard sizes. They're either kind of three to four feet wide and anywhere from kind of five to six or seven feet long. Um, but they've gotten bigger over the years, not necessarily physically, but in terms of capacity. And what I mean is the same panel, the physically sized panel uh, that was producing maybe 150 or 200 watts, you know, five or 10 or 15 years ago, and that is now producing 300 or 350 watts. And what this means for you as a, as a homeowner or a business owner is that you can put fewer panels up on your roof and get the same amount of energy. 
So it's a smaller footprint for the, for the same energy production, which is great. Um, really quickly, I used the PV Watts tool from the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is that link right there, pvwatts.nrel.gov, uh, to estimate how much energy production you could get from just a, I picked a random address in Billings. I think I just used the greater Billings area. Um, and a five kilowatt array on average will get you about 6,600 kilowatt hours a year or about 550 kilowatt hours a month. Now, if you're a standard uh, Northwestern Energy user, uh, electricity customer, you'll end up using about 9,000 kilowatt hours a year or about 750 kilowatt hours a month. And I think that number is actually trending. It might be a year or two old um, or a couple years old. I think it's actually trending down because of um, energy efficiency um, methods and just more efficient appliances and electricity use in general. So that is to say a five or six or seven kilowatt uh, array could probably get most or all of your energy needs uh, covered for you. But again, that's something you can discuss with your installer. Um, citing your solar array, again, this is mostly within the control of your installer who will make the recommendation, but just so you know, uh, a couple things to think about is rooftop versus ground mounted. Um, the benefits being, you know, rooftop just sits up on your roof. Uh, it's a little easier. You don't have to worry about maintenance or giving up any yard space. Um, ground mounted um, costs typically a little more because of the support structure um, that you need. Uh, you may be able to place it somewhere where you get better production, but you know, you'll have to see if that additional production will offset the additional cost and, and what that'll do to your payback times. Um, shading is certainly a consideration. You want to avoid shading as much as humanly possible. Um, it will definitely reduce your energy production, um, but it's not you know, a non-starter. Um, I have a colleague here in Missoula who has a tree that was casting some shade on, on their solar array and they didn't cut down the tree, they didn't even have to lob off the branch, but they did trim the, the branch back and that totally took care of the problem. So um, it's, it's certainly a workaround, but if there's significant shading, especially from something like a structure that isn't a tree that you can trim, um, obviously that's a consideration that you'll have to work through with your installer. And then the roof angle and the roof support. So um, as we know, the sun kind of path in the sky changes from uh, season to season. Over the summer, it's coming in at a higher angle and over the winter, it's coming in at a lower angle. The most ideal angle for production is when the solar uh, radiation is coming in right at a 90 degree angle uh, to the panels themselves. So at our latitude, we typically try to put panels at about 45 degrees. Um, sometimes you can't do that based on the pitch of your roof, and that's okay. You know, you're not going to lose thousands of kilowatt hours of production just because of that. Um, but you can talk with your installer on, on methods for trying to maximize your production. Um, because of the way panels are, and, and the technology is progressing these days, putting panels on um, west-facing and east-facing parts of your roof, which used to be just really incompatible with getting good production, is now sort of an option. Um, it used to be, you know, south facing only. That was really the only good way to get get good production. Um, but the technology has just gotten way better, and so it's less of a concern, uh, which makes things easier for, you know, houses that aren't oriented perfectly to the south. Um, talking about pricing, um, the the cost of solar is just dropping incredibly rapidly, which again is why I'm excited to see. A solarized program popping up in Billings because like Tyler said I think there is um, a lot of potential there and I hope that all of you listening in tonight will help us start to realize all of that potential. Um, cost of solar uh, according to the Solar Energy Industries Association has dropped more than 70 percent uh, over the last decade which is just incredible. Um, you know the figures you're seeing on the screen that yellow line that you know less than a dollar fifty that applies more to utility scale. Um, you're not probably I would say it's extremely likely you're not going to get a price that low uh, here in Montana for a rooftop solar system. Um, but you know the prices I'm seeing are, you know, anywhere between maybe, you know, two, two fifty, three dollars, three twenty-five. Um, and I'm giving you a bit of a range because it really does depend on a number of different factors, um, and will depend on the bid that you get from the installer too. So I will go ahead and fully admit that uh, I don't want to get myself into trouble and tell you that solar costs a dollar per watt in Montana and then have some very angry installers calling me about pricing that that I was apparently promising. So um, 
you know, prices here are getting better. It is getting lower. Montana is definitely still um, is is sharing in the price uh, drops and declines that we're seeing nationally as well. So now is definitely a good time to go uh, and see what you can install. Um, talking a little bit about financing and incentives. So uh, the biggest option that you have and, and the best option that you have is the Federal Investment Tax Credit or the ITC. Um, it's a 30% tax credit or it was a 30% tax credit that is actually one of the most successful tax credits that I think we've ever seen as far as what it was intended to do and what its actual outcome was. It has spurred incredible investment in solar and renewable energy development all across the country. Um, the uh, federal tax credit was set at 30%. Um, it was uh, due to phase out in 2016 and was extended um, and then uh, has started to phase out again. And there are large efforts at the national level, Solar Energy Industries Association, among other national groups, uh, are advocating to extend the ITC again at that 30% level. Um, but unfortunately for now, it has already started to step down. So this year in 2020, it stepped down to 26%. And next year in 2021, it'll drop to 22%. And the year after in 2022, it actually drops all the way to 0% for residential customers. Uh, commercial customers, businesses can still get 10%, um, but the residential drops all the way down. So um, maybe I'll save commentary on what might happen with the new administration, um, but you know, the political landscape, this is certainly a big policy for renewable energy installations and renewable energy industry. So we'll see what happens with it, uh, you know, in the next year or two. Some other financing incentives to be aware of. Um, and again, this is where I'll reiterate, you don't have to write this all down if you're trying to scribble notes. Um, I actually sent Carolina one pager that has all this information, including about the federal ITC, uh, which she'll send out afterwards. But just so you know, um, there is a state tax credit in addition to the federal tax credit. You can get $500 per individual or up to $1,000 per household if you join file. Um, so, you know, if you're looking at just throwing a, dollar, a ballpark out there, say you're looking at a $15,000 system, that's what, you know, will be called a, a fully installed cost, means, meaning it covers equipment, installation, everything. Um, so out of pocket, you're looking at, well, fully installed, you're looking at $15,000. You can take about, you know, 26%, let's call it 25 for math's sake, um, right off the top with the ITC, that gets you down to about 12,000. You can take another $1,000 off your household, now you're at 11. So you can cut off about a third of it, um, just right off the bat through tax incentives, which is great. Um, if you live in a rural area, which unfortunately for Billings, I think you're by state definitions, the only non-rural area in, a, in, a, in the state, at least, you know, um, Billings proper. Um, but if you're outside of Billings, you may uh, qualify for the Rural Energy for America program or a REAP grant. And this is a grant for agriculture and small businesses in rural areas. You can get another 25% of the cost of the project um, and also offers energy efficiency funding as well. So something to consider and look into if you want to seek eligibility for that. Um, and then there are two really good loan options in the state that are I think more publicly or marketed and, and well known. There may be other ones that I don't know about that smaller banks or credit unions are offering, but these are the two that I know well, so the ones that I wanted to share. The first is the Alternative Energy Revolving Loan Program, which the Montana Department of Environmental Quality uh, manages. You can get up to $40,000. Uh, the interest rate this year is 3.25%, which I think is the same from last year. Um, and it actually went down a half a percentage point from the year before. So um, that's a great program and a lot of people use that. It's a, it's a really good option. Um, there are, I think, some fees. Uh, it is a, uh, I believe it's a secured loan. So there are some kind of fine print details you wanna look into, but um, it is a really great option that I know a lot of people take advantage of. The other one that's out there is um, offered by the Clearwater Credit Union and they offer home solar loans um, up to 25,000 and at a little bit higher percentage, um, but your turnaround is gonna be way faster. Um, I believe they're unsecured, so it's gonna be um, maybe less hassle on you um, and the fees are different. So, you know, those dollar amounts and those percentages on the screen are different, but what I wanna iterate to you is um, these are, are, I think they're both competitive options for you and you should look into both of them. Um, 
Clearwater Credit Union um, is based in Missoula. And in order to take advantage of their loan, you do have to be a member. So you would have to live in their in their service territory, which is kind of Missoula County, Ravalli County, uh, Butte Silver Bow. Um, but there's a there's a loophole out there where if you're a member of an organization who is based in their service territory, you can take advantage of their loans. All that is to say um, is if you're an MREA member or it might work for Northern Plains uh, affiliates, I'm not sure, um, you might be able to get access to that loan. So that is definitely a, a, a shameless plug for MREA membership, um, which I will fully admit, but it is a really great product and one that you should know about. And if you do think it will work for you, please um, reach out to them or reach out to me and I'm, I'm happy to put you in touch with them. Um, on the policy side of things, if you're going to be a rooftop solar owner, it's important for you to know about net metering. Um, I'm sure many of you probably know about net metering already, um, but if you don't, it's really important that you do. And what it is, is um, backing up a step, actually. Um, when we talk about rooftop solar or small wind or a micro hydro system, what we're talking about is what's called a distributed generation system. And what that phrase means is that the energy is distributed out amongst the customers and not a centralized generation like a like a big power plant like coal strip. So rooftop solar, small wind, that's all distributed types of generation. Net metering is a billing mechanism. And we have net metering laws in Montana that have enabled our utilities to offer this billing mechanism. What net metering does is uh, if you are generating more energy at any given time than you are consuming at your home or business, you can send that energy out to the grid for your neighbors to use. The energy just flows right to the nearest, nearest source. Um, if you do that, your utility or an energy provider will give you a credit that you can use on your next bill in order to offset your next bill's costs. So it's a way of kind of building a bank of, of energy credits uh, that you can use throughout the year. Um, typically, you can build up credits for up to 12 months, and at the 12 month mark, you will forfeit those credits back to your energy provider. Um, that is actually in state law, and most of the co ops um, apply with the um, or kind of align with that similar policy. So, typically, you're offered when you want to true up um, the, that 12 month cycle. Your utility, I think they normally offer like it's the beginning of each quarter, so January 1, April 1. Uh, what is it, July 1 and October 1. Um, if you're a residential customer in particular, always choose April 1st. The reason being, you wanna zero out your balance before you start getting into the long summer days so you can build up as many credits as you can. Then you can use those credits throughout the winter and um, you know, come the end of the winter, you'll have much fewer credits that you'll end up forfeiting. So. Um, there's a little bit of a tip for you. Um, there is an option for shared solar. I am, I'm assuming most of you are in Billings proper, but for the Billings area, if you're in co-op territory, um, shared solar is a another type of participating in net metering. Um, you know what, I was gonna talk more about this, but to be honest, if you're participating in the Solaris program, it's probably not worth me really getting into. Um, it's a way for you to participate in a larger array that your energy provider will actually develop. Um, and if you have questions about it, I'm happy to talk to you about it. I'm sure the uh, YVCC folks are as well, but um, I'm gonna actually skip that part of the presentation because I don't think it applies very much. Um, but your net metering policies. So again, assuming most of you are Northwestern customers, your limit for the size of the system you can install is 50 kW. That should cover uh, most of the installations that, you, that you'll need. Um, if you're a farmer, rancher, or business, it might not, um, at which case obviously um, you should uh, help us advocate for a larger cap. Um, if you're in co-op territory, I looked at some of the local co-ops in the area. Um, they have about a 25 kW limit. Um, net metering credits right there, it says one to one. And what that means is if you're, if you're paying in Northwestern territory, for example, 11 and a half cents per kilowatt hour for your energy, uh, then you'll be credited at that same value uh, when you push energy back onto the grid. That's all that means, uh, which is how it should be in our opinion. Um, but with that, I will go ahead and just say thank you so much again for letting me present tonight. And I will uh, stop sharing my screen so we can get into the uh, Q&A. Uh, so next up, uh, with the number of hail storms we get in Billings, how do solar panels hold up um, to hail and other in inclement weather? 
Yeah, um, great question. And this is one I wish I had a, I really need to get a solar panel to demo. Um, I've had solar installers uh, grab golf balls and throw them as hard as they can at, at solar panels and they won't break. Um, you know, they're, they're tested, that glass on, on the solar panels is tested to withstand some pretty strong and pretty severe weather. Um, so things like hail, um, you know, uh, shouldn't really have much of an impact at all. Um, things like rain are actually good for it. It'll actually clean off the panel, um, you know, little specks of dirt and things like that. Rain will wash it off. Um, as far as snow maintenance goes, um, some people will get out there in the winter and brush the snow off of their panels. Some people won't. It's definitely up to you. Um, I actually just wrote a blog post on Maria's blog about snow and solar uh, that I recommend you check out. But, um, you know, if you've got two feet of snow on there, you're going to lose production. If it's just a couple of inches, it'll actually probably um, melt as the panels warm up and, and kind of slide off itself. Um, are there any local fire departments considerations for rooftop installations? Yeah, there definitely are. Um, you know, there are regulations um, and, and codes that all installers will follow. Um, and, you know, the installers are used to doing that. Um, typically, it has to do with spacing and access requirements on roofs for, you know, how, uh, how fire personnel can get to certain areas. Um, but your installers know how to work with things like the fire code and the electric code and, and can work through all that. Um, there's also some requirements, like I said, through the interconnection agreements, through the utility. Um, so all of those kind of safety considerations are certainly um, documented and, and managed and your installer will be able to take care of those. All right. Next up, uh, with current panels, what is their efficiency loss over time? The life of your system and the warranty of your system will typically be about 20 or 25 years, but that's actually based um, on the components other than the panels. Uh, panels will continue producing for decades with, with very low uh, kind of degradation or, or drop in efficiency. Um, I think it might be a percentage or something like that, or maybe a couple percentage over, over years and years. Um, so it, it holds up pretty well to the test of time. Um, something like your inverter is much more likely to need an update or replacing after 15 or 20 years uh, than your panels. Um, how hard is it to replace roof shingles after the panels are installed? As far as replacing roof shingles, so if you're going to replace your roof, for example, and there's a solar array up there, um, typically the installer comes out and will take it down for you. Uh, the, the solar panels will actually protect your roof. Um, I've seen some really kind of interesting and, and kind of funny photos of a roof with solar panels that were taken down after being up there for a year or multiple years, excuse me, and you can see like a tracing of the array and the, the tiles that were underneath the panel, uh, panels were in great condition. And, you know, the other ones had, had wear due to weather and exposure and things like that. So um, it will actually protect your roof. But, but if you do have to do any kind of maintenance or, um, uh, you know, do a, a full scale replacement of your roof, they'll have to come down. Homeowners insurance, um, how does it affect that? Is it covered by that? Yeah. Um, so, I've gotten asked this question a bunch and I've reached out to a number of installers. Um, my understanding is it shouldn't impact your homeowners and homeowners insurance much, um, if at all. Um, I, th I think it should be, it, again, should. Um, it, it'll probably depend on your insurance company. Um, and it's still relatively new, you know, for being covered. But um, long story short, uh, I don't think it should impact your insurance too much. Um, it's, it's certainly something to bring up. Um, as far as property value goes, you know, I think between the, you know, any potential increase in property value, which might cause a slight increase in taxes or things like that should probably come out in the wash based on, you know, the higher value of the home when you go to sell it, you know, it may not uh, dollar and cents wise increase the value of your home. But I think, you know, people will appreciate moving into a house where they know there's solar and, and, you know, locked in energy costs for 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, yeah, just wanted to uh, thank you again, Andrew, for joining us and uh, sharing all the knowledge about solar installations and how this whole business works. So that webinar gives you some idea of the kinds of things you, you could be looking at for solarization of your home. Uh, the Yellowstone Valley Citizens Council has talked to solar installers that will install solar systems in your homes here in Billings. Uh, you can get an assessment of your home. It doesn't cost anything. And take a look at this website uh, that sh I show here on the screen. Get on there if you're interested. Uh, actually, you can sign up for an assessment by getting on to that uh, website. So I hope, that you, I hope you found this program interesting. And by the way, keep warm. <laughs>